going on, Packers fans? Aaron Eggler here with Cheesehead TV, ready to talk some football with my good buddy Andy Herman from the Pack a Day podcast, Packer Report, and everything Packers around the internet. Andy, how the hell are you today? Oh, I'm here. I mean, what an incredible improvement by the Packers special teams. I mean, just <laughs> night and day difference. Uh, I mean, they did not do anything that would make you believe that they would lose the game for you. I mean, just just an amazing improvement by the special teams. There you go. And that's it for this week. <laughs> no, we got to talk about the rest of it. But hey, let's start with the special teams, because let's start with something that didn't look abysmal. I mean, yeah. they actually look competent. They actually covered well. Uh, the fair catches were clean on Amari's part. I mean, overall, the operation, the extra one extra point they had to kick. Everything looked okay on special teams. There you go. Look at you bringing the Yeah, I know. Nice, line. nice positive takeaway. I think we had one Rudy Ford missed tackle, one sort of high snap by Jack Coco. But other than that, pretty – it looked like a – not quite a well-oiled machine, Aaron, but it looked right. it looked competent. It looked competent. It did. Just it did. beautiful. I will say, even on the Rudy Ford miss tackle, I mean, at least he's down there. Oh, right? for sure. And he, he, and he holds the guy up and the, the cavalry arrives. And that's so much better than – It is grown accustomed to in green Bay, so i we'll will take it. take it what i won't take is what we saw on both sides of the ball other than special teams i mean let's start i mean I, it's so hard <laughs> I, for me okay let's start on the defensive side of the ball because coming off the game right heading into the evening creating the content then going back and dipping my toe into some of the the rewatch to start you know in the evening I was feeling pretty despondent about the defense until I actually went back and watched it. And it is kind of that old coaching saying, and I suspect we'll hear Matt talk about this here in a little bit when LaFleur addresses the media about how it's never as bad as you think it is. And it's never as good as it possibly, you know, maybe feels in the moment. I thought the defense actually played better than I thought they were playing while I was watching it live. Like you certainly get emotional about things. And when Justin Jefferson's, you know, basically running free in the secondary, basically again and again and again, you do get kind of despondent and feel like, what in the hell are we doing? But you go back and you watch it, and they actually hold up pretty well on third down, I thought, which was a big problem at times last year. And overall, I thought their play was pretty good. They just got killed by Jefferson on early downs, which last year, I think the problem was third down in that building. This year, it was first down. And to me, that was something that probably points to the Vikings taking advantage of what they expected to see from the Packers. Yeah, I thought, first of all, I thought Minnesota had a really well-planned attack. I thought they were super well coached in that game, and I thought they had a fantastic game plan. Unfortunately, I can't say the same about the Packers, but more on that in a moment. I, I did think even during the game, um, there were stretches where I actually really liked what I saw of this Packers defense. And I do think that if you look both offense and defense, I think the defense is the one where you can sort of look at it and have – some positive takeaways, but clearly some negatives as well. So let's go through some of those positives, right? Six drives that had really positive results. Three plays, negative five yards punt. Five plays, 20 yards punt. Three plays, negative one, or three plays, one yard punt. Four plays, negative five yards field goal. That's another point here too, is that yes, they allowed 23. Three of those were based on a turnover where the the, the offense actually went five yards in the negative and they yeah. still got a field goal off of it. So right. that's not the Packers defense fault. Five plays, 20 yards punt, seven plays, 34 yards punt. Those six drives, 27 plays, 65 yards, five punts, and a field goal that wasn't the defense's fault. So you put that together, you allow four scoring drives ultimately, 20 total points, that is your fault. Like, that's not, like, most days that's going to get the job done with an Aaron Rodgers-led team. If you if you allow 20 points that are your fault and, and take care of things on that end. Now, that said, other four drives, 78 yards touchdown, 89 yards field goal, 74 yards touchdown, 74 yards field goal. So those were time-consuming drives where they couldn't get off the field. And I think the, the most egregious thing here is, of course, letting the one guy that can't beat you beat you. And I get that you can't just have Jair Alexander in man-to-man -man coverage on the same guy all game. You have to mix it up. This is 2022. You can't play man on every down. You're going to get crushed by crossers and man beaters and pick plays and everything else, right? That said, he crushed the Packers in Minnesota last year, and they've had all offseason to figure out how they can stop maybe the most dominant player in the division that they are going to see in the division for the foreseeable future. They've had a lot of time to review that and think about that. 
And they should have probably, I don't know, a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D to deal with that guy. And either they didn't or all of their plans did not work because yes, you know, Jair Alexander more on Jefferson. That's a, you, you would like to see that. I think there's things they could have done, whether it's a hybrid man zone where you just have Jair travel and you play zone on the back end, whether it's at least disguising like Jair is going to go in coverage with them and play zone on the back end and at least make it look like Jair is going to be on him in coverage. Like I think there's a lot of things at their disposal that they didn't do, but whatever it is that you want to do, there's more than one ways to take out a player. Heck the 49ers gave the Packers a PhD in taking out a star receiver in the playoff game just a season ago, go back and watch that tape and see what they did because that certainly seemed to work a lot better than what Green Bay did. So um, some good things, some bad things and some frustrating things to say the least. The, the thing that drives me nuts, it's like, I understand. I a hundred percent understand what you're talking about as far as, you know, Minnesota having a great plan, moving Jefferson around. I get it. No, you can't play man every play, but you can be a little bit more aggressive. You can Agreed. be a little bit more assertive. You can try to put the fight to them rather than, and this is the thing that Matt seemingly didn't want and didn't like about Mike Patton that they brought Barry in and yes, and you're not always going to be playing up, but the amount of times they had guys sitting eight, 10, 12 yards off the line of scrimmage, free releases, just welcoming their new overlords into the defensive secondary. I, to me, that was what was so kind of not upsetting, but it was so frustrating to see it over and over and over again. And this idea that, okay, yes, no, a hundred percent. You can't play man all the time. But you can certainly get Jair in better situations where you can have him following Jefferson wherever the hell he's going and have your Absolutely. rules be, okay, when this motion happens, because you know they're going to motion him. Yep. You know they're going to motion him. Have some rules in place where you can have Jair follow him a little bit. The fact that they just didn't at all kind of just blows my mind. You talk about it being 2022. Exactly. You have to have a defense. You have to have a defense that is able to respond and absolutely be malleable to these kind of offenses that are going to use motion. I mean, motion's like, what is this, 1955? What, did you know. just discover something that has never been seen by your eyes before? That, to me, was what was so frustrating about this game plan that, like, again, they have good stretches, and you saw a lot of good things, but, man, when it went bad, it went real bad. And it was, it was really curious as why it was, like, kind of, that was the approach. It did, and to, to your point, it's not like they're like, well... They lined him up all over and put him in motion. There's nothing we can do. You Throw know, up your hands. Yep. You know? uh, he's going like, to put up what? 200. You know, it's like, well, that's just game nothing set we can do. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That, that is, it, it is eternally frustrating. What was surprising to me going back and watching it too was there were, there were certainly instances where they got pressure on Kirk Cousins. And we can flip this now to the offensive side of the ball because what I thought was astounding and really noticeable was what a good job Kirk Cousins did of knowing when to get the ball out of his hands. There were a number of times where either Kenny or Preston or a combination were kind of constricting the pocket. And right when you thought, and I think O'Connell talked about this after the game, right when you thought they were going to get to him, he found either his outlet guy or threw it away to the sideline, you know, so he doesn't get a rough or a grounding penalty. He knows where his guy is, et cetera. Talk about the timing in your head as a quarterback. And then you flip that around, you look at Aaron Rodgers. I know he's working with new receivers. Um, I know they have to like go into this hostile environment, work on a silent count, etc. I get all the moving parts, but man, the number of times where Rodgers gets back there and just pats the ball and tries to find somebody. And they seemingly had all of this downfield stuff in the game plan where you're really just playing into the Vikings hands in that regard. Like that to me, the night and day of, a quarterback who is playing in rhythm and on time versus a quarterback who is really uncomfortable and not playing in rhythm at all. Yeah, I thought it was a rough game from Aaron. No two ways about it. I thought there were opportunities where he had oppor you know, chances to get rid of the ball and just didn't. I thought there were a couple of plays on third downs where if he maybe looks a little bit different or kind of keeps his eyes moving, he had the opportunity to distribute the ball a little bit better. And I, I think the one thing that – you know, it sometimes gets frustrating. And I've seen this, uh, you know, on multiple occasions with both Matt and, and Aaron is that, you know, all the, the, the play action deep stuff and, and, you know, trying to get a shot play in there. Yep. That's great when you're even, or when you're ahead in the game, because the, the opposing team doesn't know if you're going to run the ball or like things like that. Like you have everything at, at your disposal. Like 
Minnesota is going to keep two safeties back and not going to let you beat them deep when they're up by 17 points. Like, and and I get like, you know, at at some point you have to realize like, Hey, if we're just going to have to try to dink and dunk, like this is probably not going to go either. You need to take some chances and try to exploit the, and get the ball down the field. But at the same token, you have to understand that like, okay, if that initial read is not there, like we have to live to see another down or just check it down or figure out something because Clearly, you know, hucking one up for an interception, taking the sack fumble, taking other sacks that could have been avoidable. um, That's not a recipe for success either. So uh, when they get down and it's, you know, double digits or whatever it is, they have to have explosives built in their playbook that are not necessarily these long drawn out play action, two man routes where you're going to have corners on the outside. You're going to have two safeties deep. And I don't know exactly what you're expecting to accomplish in that situation. And even if you want to pull one out of your rabbit hat, like, all right, Right. we need to check down, get rid of the ball. What killed me about the, I'm so glad you brought that up because what killed me about the, the fumble, the play that resulted in Rogers fumbling the football is that comes after a series of plays where they're really successful. And they're running the football. And it's like, instead of, okay, we've spent the whole game setting up a play action bomb. The Packers seem to feel like, oh, well, we ran three really good plays. So clearly you're going to bite on this play action now. It's like they try to, I don't know. They're trying to like, to your point, they're trying to like get big chunk plays down the field. I understand it, but yeah, you're not setting it up to the point where anybody's going to be biting on anything. You haven't had any sustained success to make them change their cover two shell that that to me the impatience is what drives me insane because we've seen that and that's the theme to me on offense that kind of permeates through all these losses in the Lafleur era where we quote we talk about oh they didn't get off the bus or they just looked listless or whatever but it's the impatience on offense the expectation that they're going to be able to get it all back in big chunks like two or three play drives or something where all you all you can do in that instance is dink and dunk and matriculate it down the field because you know they're going to play coverage. You know they're going to play off. They're inviting you to try and take those shots because they know you're trying to get back into the game. And for whatever reason, I don't know if it's you know the combination of Matt and Aaron or if it's Aaron himself or what have you, but man, they always fall into this trap once they get down two or more scores. And I think too, I think a piece of it is you know, Matt Lafleur is very good at trying to figure out times and ways that he can do something different that, than you're expecting, right? So I think I think sometimes it's paralysis by analysis. What I would like to see more of, and especially going back to exactly what you're talking about, is AJ Dillon was just cruising at that point. Like you get him the ball in the passing game, kills the ball in the running game. Kills me that they killed that drive because it was he just was he was downhill, so well. he was running, and they're playing two deep safeties, so you have an advantage in the box, like, and you're doing well. So like I, I think sometimes I know that you know then the expectation is going to be like, all right, they're going to try to take away Dylan now. But at the same token, sometimes you just have to go with what is working and keep pounding it until they stop it. And again, it's not like they were just going to Dylan and like halfback dives, right? They were using him creatively. They were getting the ball in his hands and he was, it was working. So I think sometimes they just have to sort of stick to that. And it was 20 to seven at the time with the, with the right. ball driving, yep. starting to drive down the field as the start of the fourth and quarter. And it's the third quarter. You've yeah, got the exactly. whole second half to go. That's what yep. blows my mind. They, that's what I mean when I say they're playing as if like they're up against the clock or something, they've got to get it all back. And it's like, guys, you've got a whole half of football to play. Just run the ball, think and dunk and move it down the field. It, it feels like they get when they get down like that, it feels like they are immediately on tilt. It feels yep. like they thousand Ro- percent Rogers and LaFleur, when they if it's down like seven or ten, it mm-hmm. you can feel like yep. their need to get a touchdown now. Like you yep. can just feel like they have no patience, like they hate. You can just tell, and I get like you don't want to be down and you want to get back in that game. Um, but like, you can just feel the intensity and like, like we gotta, we gotta score right now. And it's like, that's almost the exact worst thing that you can do because that's when teams start to play coverage deep. And like, they're going to, they're not going to give you those deep plays. Like that's when like you're, you're dictated to, you have to take what's there for you. And it's like, they're almost trying to force the opposite and just get back in that game right now. And like you said, it's at seven, like it's what 17 to seven or whatever it was 20 to seven. Uh, 20 to 7, like yep. beginning of the fourth quarter, you've got a ton of time left. Like if you need to go down and sustain a drive and score points on it, you're going to still be okay, but they, they just want it back so fast. Talking about, you know, what they're doing on offense and the time that Rodgers has or doesn't have, you got to look at the offensive line. Obviously the play of the tackles was always going to be under the microscope after we knew that Bakhtiari and Jenkins weren't going to be in there. I mean, Jake Hansen's completely overwhelmed. 
I, I don't understand. I mean, maybe possibly Zach Tom comes in and is worse. I, I don't know. I know he had to end up playing at left guard because of uh, 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 left guard's name is escaping me now. John Runyon, Jr. John Runyon has to go out with a concussion. And then you got Tom in there. And I thought Tom held up okay. I didn't think he played great. But yeah, he pressure. certainly looked better than Hanson. I mean, to me, Hanson, you talk about – I don't know how you roll him out there on Sunday night against the Bears. I really don't. And it's a question of being able to just operate offensively. They got some issues there. And it sounds like from Ryan Woods reporting that they're planning on Bakhtiari not being out there again against the Bears, probably Jenkins as well. You got to make this work. And I just don't see as Hanson as part of the solution here. And and here's the other thing too, right? So like, may, let's just, for the sake of argument, say that like Hanson's a little bit better than Zach Tom right now. If it is, it's pretty minimal, right? right? And if you're already with your offensive line taking this approach of like, hey, this is a long-term approach. We need Bakhtiari and Jenkins and these guys ready to go at the end of the season. You would think that with just uh, you know a few more reps and some in-game action, that the much, much, much better long-term play here is clearly Zach Tom. Like that's so even if Hansen is a small portion better than than Zach Tom right now, let Zach Tom get those reps and make those mistakes. And it's much more likely, at least in my opinion, that he is going to learn from those. And he in, you know, in the same time that Jake Hansen's had to develop, which has been two plus years now, is going to be well ahead of where Jake Hansen is at this point. So um, it just seems to me that at minimum, the, the difference is close if Tom's not better. And I think that if you get him more reps and more experience, he's going to be significantly better than Jake Hansen. So, yeah, I just think, you know, I'm not sure the decision, both short term and long term. I know Tom did not play the best. He certainly had a couple pressures and um, but there was some good stuff, too. And certainly some, yes, of the, there was. some better yeah. stuff than what I thought Hansen put on tape. So they're going to have to look at that closely. Hopefully they do. How much do you think? I mean, obviously, we know this team is not going to panic. Uh, they're not going to change their M.O. much, if at all. That's what that's always been their gig with Matt in town. And Aaron has echoed that. And uh, I suspect we'll see not a similar approach on offense. I don't think they're going to change much. But do you think they do? I don't want to say run the ball more because it's never that simple. But do you think they try to feature the backs a little bit more because you know, every time they seem to get going against the Vikings, it certainly seemed to be because they were flowing through their running backs. Yeah, I think so. But I do think that right now there's, this is a bit of a a worst case scenario for this Packers offense because they have to develop something down the field. And right now, probably the only guys that can do that with any like real threat are Romeo Dobbs and Christian Watson, both rookies. And we saw obviously the drop from Watson. So like, that's going to be a work in progress. I thought Sammy Watkins looked a step slow. I don't think he's going to challenge much down the field. Maybe you get Lazard back and maybe that can help. But we know like Lazard's made some big plays in his career, but he's probably not going to be a consistent, you know, big play threat down Deep the field. field right, Randall right. Cobb is not that. Amari Rogers didn't even play in the game and is not that anyway. So like they've got to figure out how to get some explosives and they had one and they just missed it. But I think that's the first thing. Um, I, I think they've got to figure out a way to throw to the outside because it, it just seemed like Rodgers and the wide receivers didn't have much of a chance against Minnesota's defense. And while I think it's really important to utilize Tunyon in the backs and get those guys involved because that's clearly what was working, um, I do think that sometimes you're also playing into defense's hands, especially in today's day and age where you're going to play off a little bit and you're going to rally to the football. The Vikings, for their, you know, I think they've got some coverage deficiencies, but they come up and they tackle really, really well in their secondary. And that that didn't play into Minnesota's or they played into Minnesota's strengths really well, um, which yeah. is, I think, an issue. And then in the meantime, like if you're trying to get these shots down the field, you don't have the offensive line right now to protect either. And you don't have the offensive line to necessarily run the ball with a, a ton of consistency either. So like they've j- they're going to have to really, you know, use some smoke and mirrors, I think, until they get some of these playmakers, you know, ready to go consistently on the outside. And until they get a Bakhtiaria Jenkins, hopefully John Runyon Jr. back and, and ready to go. So um, Aaron and, and Matt have some heavy lifting to do. They're going to have to figure it out. But um, at home, I, I expect a, a much different outcome, hopefully this week in a, a more explosive offense. Totally agree there. You can find his stuff on the Pack a Day podcast on She Said TV and everywhere you get your podcasts. Pack a report for all his writings and musings about the green and gold. Andy, I can't thank you enough for hanging out and talking football, man. I appreciate it as always. Thanks so much, Aaron.